Uh, the last talk for the day. My name is Wei Liang. I am from Tinkerbox and Engage Rocket at the moment. That's a strange situation. I'll not go more into it. Uh, but here are your five random movie tips for today. I didn't realize I put an animation there. Okay. Uh, first one is for people who somewhat at the intermediate level, expert level, consider themselves fluent in Ruby or, and or Rails. Um, the story behind this, and there is a story behind this, is that uh, I undertook a pretty large project sometime about a year ago. And by mean, what I mean by a large project is a uh, project at the scale in Rails, where if the only Ruby classes you have are the controllers and the models, it's either really bad or it's actually not as big as you think. So um, we had a lot of uh, abstraction and modeling to do. Service classes, form objects, decorators, presenters, and stuff like that. So um, we had to think about more ways to structure our code beyond the, the normal real structures. And, uh, and that was where I found that my exposure, which was mainly Rails and Ruby, was my limiting, limiting factor. Because in any other language, you, you don't have so much hand-holding. You have to figure out how you want to structure your code. You're kind of forced into that. So my reasoning for this is uh, twofold. Firstly, you will learn to appreciate Ruby more. I, I studied computer science, kind of, at SETD. And uh, I think I often take for granted the fact that I learned Java and Python, um, which I don't realize, but I can see it when I compare myself sometimes. It has informed the way I look at programming and about programming in Ruby and Rails. Um, and I love Ruby more for it, because I know how bad it can get. So yes, you will appreciate Ruby more. The second thing is, and this is the more important thing, you will learn to think in new ways. I was programming in Ruby and Rails for the, the better part of the past two years. Then I went to this project where I had to think outside of Rails. I felt kind of lost, out, out of my depth. Um, and this is where I started to realize that uh, I had become stuck in a particular way of thinking about abstractions, stuck in a way of uh, breaking my code down. So what I'm trying to say is, when you get out of Rails, you are forced into that. You will learn to think in new ways. And that's, that's the value of going outside of Ruby. I'm not saying don't come back. Okay? Come back to Ruby after you're done. Okay? But, but venture, okay? explore. Okay, so for those of you who don't know where to start, here are some lines that you can use to draw against Ruby. Ruby is considered a class-oriented language or object-oriented language. So one of the inverse, or uh, it's often, often uh, put in opposition to other languages called functional languages. In addition, Ruby is a dynamically typed language. For those of you who don't know what that means, you don't have to declare the type of a variable. The variable at one point can, can hold a number, and another point can hold a string. This is not true in all programming languages. So another programming language, like for example Java, is a good example of this statically strong typed language. Compiled languages. Ruby is an interpreted language. Again, for those of you who don't know what this means, you have an interpreter. So it, it, the code is evaluated and executed at runtime. There is no compile step. You can test out code pretty easily by spinning up IRB. You can't do that with Java. Java is a compiled language, again. And lastly, and this is more for, for the more advanced people, there are non-garbage collected languages. I haven't done this myself. Um, but when you do get into this, you get the appreciation for the fact that the computer manages memory for you in Ruby. And uh, sometimes, it does better, sometimes it doesn't do so well. So yes, that is tip number one. Learn to do something outside of Ruby. Oh, man, okay. Tip number two, use Robocop, but not blindly. I don't know how many times you guys have uh, 
put stuff in your Rubocop file to ignore certain files, or you have added lines in your source code to say, this chunk of code, I'm going to ignore this corp or ignore that corp. Um, what I mean by not using it blindly is don't just make the changes to accommodate Rubocop. Okay. When Rubocop complains to you about your code, find out why that corp exists. What is that corp trying to catch? Right? Only then can you decide and make a judgment on does this situation apply to you? Is this something you need to worry about in your code base? Most of the time, it will be yes. Sometimes, it will be no. So use Rubocop. Now, as a junior developer, the benefits I've gotten from using Rubocop is the fact that it's got me thinking about what makes code better. This is a very nebulous thing as a programmer. It's like when you start programming, right? what is good code? You don't know what good code is. You just have this term thrown about by all the experienced mentors that, that you happen to have if you're lucky. So Rubocop is like the signals that catch these, these things for you. When the offense comes up, when you run Rubocop, that is your opportunity to have a discussion about why is this bad? So that's my second piece of advice, actually, when you use Rubocop. When something comes up, read up about it. Find out why the COP exists. Have a conversation with your mentors and your senior developers about what they think about this COP. Okay, because you're not working in a silo, usually. You're working in a team, right? So you want to know what your team thinks about this COP. And then you can make an informed judgment about what to do about the offense. OK, and that's number two. Tip number three. This is where I go into a more conceptual uh, thing. This tip is a, it's a bit hard to explain. So it's, uh, this is where I uh, you know, fumble a bit, I think. So think of programming as building a machine with interacting parts, and you design the parts. Now, I'm going to break this down a bit. When you start out as a programmer, you're not thinking about programming as building parts. You just put everything in one script, and you run the script, and it does what you want it to do. Sometimes you'll be forced to uh, break your program up into parts. Like in Rails, you are forced to put code in the controller versus the view versus the model. Of course, you, you don't have so much consideration of the parts. The, parts are, the structure of that is enforced upon you. In other words, when you are starting out, you're not really thinking of the designing or building of the machine. You're, fol you're following tutorials. You are going through the steps. You, are, you don't really know what the steps are doing or how you can adjust the steps to meet your particular situation. You don't know whether you can omit the steps. In some, like in some situations, you can. You don't know if you can add more things to the steps. How can you modify the steps to suit your, your particular situation. You're just following the tutorial. And if in your particular situation, the tutorial steps don't apply, then you're screwed, right? You get stuck. You don't know what to do next. You find another tutorial. You throw away everything you've done in the tutorial, and you try and follow the new tutorial. Hopefully, it works out this time. You don't really know what you're doing, basically. You're not thinking of the parts in the machine. You're not designing the parts. But then programming is system design. You are designing the parts. You are designing a system of interacting parts. Okay. So going back to these examples, I use origami and baking. Um, I don't know how many of you guys ever folded a paper crane and understood why you had to fold a paper crane in that sequence of steps. Uh, I certainly have never. I still don't. Um, but it is a system. There is a, there's a process. There's a reason why all those steps are there. Okay? And if you don't understand those steps, you can only fold the same paper crane many, many times. Right? You can't fold your own thing. That's not the value of programming. You don't want to build the same block app hundreds of times. Right? So the other thing is that for the for newer, inexperienced uh, programmers. 
the barrier to this is the fact that they're trying to get past Ruby as a language, the tools, the uh, process. How does Ruby work? Right? So as a new programmer, this is the hardest thing. In fact, if you can do this, this tip, this thinking of programming like you're building a machine of interacting parts, you should consider yourself not a beginner anymore. Right? This is advanced programming in a way. Because you have to get past the fact that you're dealing with Ruby and its gems as tools. Now, in a sense, you have to get fluent with Ruby and Rails in order to start thinking in these terms as a design, uh, as a design thing instead of uh, following a set of steps in order to achieve the thing that you want. So the thing I have to say here is that you can learn to use your tools the way they're meant to be used or the way they're advertised to be used and the ways that they can be used and the ways they should be used. I'll give you an example. If you were a DIY person, you learn how to use a drill. You know what drills are for? They're meant for drilling holes. That's not the only way you can use a drill. You can use a drill sideways. Drill into, to cut a slot into a piece of wood, if you will. There are many ways you can use a drill. Just as there are many ways you can use a saw or a screwdriver. All these things are tools. They have their intended uses. They have their advertised uses. They have their um, they're the ways that they are best used and the ways that they are not so well used. And there are many different ways you can use them. So as a programmer, to get to the point where you can think of programming like a, as a design thing, I think the thing is to realize that you have to learn how to use your tools and be flexible about how you use your tools. Uh, I don't feel satisfied with how I describe this. <laughs> okay, but I'll move on. Okay, tip number four. Practice the law of Demeter. That's unreasonable. This is where I invoke one of those uh, exalted programming principles that everyone is supposed to follow, the, call, the law of Demeter, otherwise known as LOD. What is the law of Demeter? This is the way I understand it. Um, you can find the Wikipedia page on this. It's not, this is not from the Wikipedia page, but it borrows from the previous tip. So if you think about a program as a system of interacting parts, then your parts should only know and interact with the neighboring parts and not need to reach into the neighbors of the neighbors. Right? Also, your parts should know as little as possible about the neighboring parts. Why? Why follow this principle? I found at least that um, if you try and practice following this, you start thinking in a different way. You start reaching the way of thinking that you, can, you get to when you're trying to think of programming as a design thing. You start thinking about the way your parts interact and also about interfaces. So as a Ruby programmer, if you've only done Ruby, the idea of interfaces may not come naturally to you, as opposed to if you did Java, for example. Um, but they are there. We design classes, right? And you want to minimize the interfaces as far as possible. So this kind of thinking is not natural to the beginning Ruby programmer, or any programmer for that matter. So my advice is to start practicing this, to hone this way of thinking. Also, of course, and this is the main reason why people advocate this principle, you get a code base that's a lot easier to work with. You get a code base that is, uh, some people call good code, hopefully. Right? So that is tip number four. Tip number five, and this is the most uh, practical one. Use a documentation browser. How many guys don't know what a documentation browser is? Okay, very few. I think that's a good sign. So for those of you who don't know, um, okay, I, didn't, I skipped the explanation of what a documentation browser is, but basically using a documentation browser makes it more convenient for you to check documentation, makes it easier to look up documentation. The result is you will check documentation more 
That means you will learn more about documentation, you will learn more about the language and how the language is built and constructed. You will learn more about the standard library. The result is you will learn more about the language, right? And you will become a better programmer. So you will learn more about the tools. You will understand your tools better. You understand the tools better, you get to get to the level of thinking about programming as a design action, as an act of design, not as an act of just following steps, typing letters into a machine to get it to do what you want it to do. So, what are the options for documentation browser? I have four here. If you're on Mac OS X, Dash is the original. Dash is very convenient. Uh, you type in the, or rather you download the language sets for documentation that you're, you're interested in. So this can be Ruby, it can be Rails. It includes outside of Ruby and Rails, so you can download documentation for JavaScript or Git or Vim, etc. Velocity is the Windows equivalent. There is Zeal, which aims to be aims to work across all the platforms. I hate the UI. Um, if you go to the website, you'll see what I mean. The last option is this: is the option that I think is the most beginner-friendly is the DevDocs.io. This is run from the website, um, which means you don't have to do the installation, and you can make it run offline. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.